Investigators, we head back to Nevada for this case of political power, murder, mystery, and the suspect who has never wavered away from his story of innocence. But before we dive into the case, I want to remind you that we have a special shout out to everyone who wrote reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you. It really helps independent podcasts like this one get noticed. So please subscribe, rate five star, and write a review. After the episode, we'll also share with you two true crime podcasts that I think that you're really going to like. More on that after the case. The murder of Kathy Augustine. Investigators, buckle up. You're on deadline. From the Hollywood Hills to your ear holes, this is True Crime Deadline. A podcast discussing cold cases, murder mysteries, and completely random thoughts. Now, here's your host, a man who stands in front of crime scene tape and talks on the TV box for a living, Mr. Mystery himself, Matt Johnson. Thank you for joining me for this week's episode, episode nine, The Murder of Politician Kathy Augustine, which takes us back to the biggest little city in the world, Reno, Nevada, the 86th most populated city in the United States, the second biggest city in the state of Nevada, with a population right now of about 225,000 people. So Reno, in case you haven't been, it's located in Washoe County, northern Nevada, 220 miles or three and a half hours east of San Francisco, and about 30 miles, which is 30 minutes away from Carson City, Nevada, and that's the state capital. We're going to be talking about that a lot in today's episode. Reno is known for those neon casino signs in downtown, and I would call those casinos a smaller version of the Las Vegas casinos. And there's the Reno Arch in the same area of downtown, which we talked about last episode. But also some interesting facts about the town is that there's the World Poker Tournament hosted there occasionally, and there's a national bowling stadium downtown, and that's been featured in a lot of movies. Reno was once the divorce capital in the world because there was no waiting period to get married or divorced, and a lot of women would actually throw their wedding rings into the Truckee River after their divorce, and that river runs in the heart of downtown. And Reno was also the home of Kathy Augustine, a political star who was murdered in her own home by someone she trusted, someone she loved. Something's wrong with my wife. She's not breathing. I don't know what happened to her. Kathy Marie Alfano was born in Los Angeles, California, May 29, 1956. She was well-liked, well-read, ambitious, tenacious, and smart growing up. She loved politics and voters would one day love Kathy. After graduating from Occidental College with a degree in political science, she went on to get her master's degree from Cal State Long Beach, and while there, she served as a congressional intern in Washington, D.C. Her personal life, not so great. She wasn't so lucky in love. She was married twice, divorced twice, but had a daughter by the name of Dallas, and their relationship, not great either. Rocky, at best. She met her third husband, Charles Augustine, while working for Delta Airlines in Las Vegas. She was a flight scheduler and would sometimes work as a flight attendant. She was a single mother, raising Dallas. Charles was a pilot, 15 years her senior, and had some adult children of his own from a previous marriage. They were married for about a decade when Kathy decided she was going to try her hand at politics, Nevada state politics. Charles didn't like the idea, according to his son, and said that he wanted to stay out of the limelight and also wanted Kathy to stay at home. But from the get-go, Kathy became a political star, rising in the Republican Party. She was addicted to politics. She was elected to state assembly from 93 to 1995 and elected to state senate from 95 to 99. Now, after Senate, Kathy became the first woman to be elected as state controller. That's the fifth highest position in politics in the state of Nevada. But as her career was on the rise, her personal life, again, not so great. After 17 years of marriage, her friends say that her relationship with Charles was shaky. In 2002, they were separated. And on New Year's Eve that year, Kathy actually bought a home 
in her own name in Reno. A few months later in 2003, Charles, who is still living in their Las Vegas mansion, by some standards, had a stroke. Kathy held vigil by his side at Sunrise Medical Hospital in Las Vegas, where he was. And she became friends with a lot of the staff that was taking care of him, including William Charles Higgs, who goes by Chaz. Chaz Higgs is a former Navy nurse, a golfer, a surfer from North Carolina with an identical twin brother. He was married twice before, also divorced, and he filed bankruptcy twice in the past. He didn't make a lot of money. In 2003, he was working at Sunrise Medical Center and living in a trailer. He had been working there for about a year, and friends said that he really liked it. He loved it. Co-workers called him a good nurse. So he starts up a friendship with Kathy. The two are seen having lunch together a lot at the hospital while her husband's there. And soon that friendship turns romantic. But Kathy is still married, and her estranged husband is improving. That is, until Charles suffers complications and dies. Three weeks after being admitted into the hospital, Kathy is now widowed and the beneficiary of his $1 million life insurance policy. She lays him to rest at a graveyard in Las Vegas and then takes a trip to Hawaii. Her friend said that the trip was pre-planned, but what did come as a shock was the fact that she invited someone from the hospital. Chaz Higgs. Chaz was much younger than Kathy. He was 39 at the time, and she was 50. The two only knew each other for three weeks, but while in Hawaii, Kathy asked Chaz to marry her, and he accepted. Once back in Nevada, Kathy was back at work, and in January of 2004, the White House, under the George W. Bush administration, was considering Kathy to be a finalist to become the U.S. Treasurer. Kathy is in the top of her game right now. She's rich, she's a newlywed, and that's when her career takes a nosedive. I think that we can finally get a fair and nonpartisan trial in the state Senate. And this is when I meet Kathy Augustine. That's a clip of Kathy doing a local news interview at the time. It's 2004. I'm 24 years old. I'm a reporter at the CBS station in Reno, Nevada. And Kathy Augustine is one of the biggest stories, if not the biggest story, that year. Because while she's under consideration for U.S. Treasurer, which is huge, it comes to light that she may have violated state ethics laws and used state employees and equipment for her re-election campaign back in 2002. All of the local TV stations are there, from Reno and from Las Vegas. They're in Carson City. It is rows and rows of live trucks in front of the state capitol building. I covered it every single day. I was live in front of the capitol building, which basically has a silver dome roof, but the building itself looks like a a church or a small courthouse in, in an old town. That's what it looks like. And I'm standing in front of this uh, for days, and it's snowing. It is absolutely freezing, and I'll never forget it. Not guilty, Madam President. The trial, it was also like a soap opera. There were 13 witnesses that painted Kathy as a controlling person, a mean boss, an evil person, and very calculated. While the defense said that the charges were written before the evidence even came out. And she had a long list of political enemies that wanted to see her destroyed while she was being considered for this huge role in the U.S. Now, in the end, she was impeached for violating campaign ethics laws. And she was not removed from office, however, and not done with state politics. In 2006, she was on a mission to rebuild her life and her political career. She termed out as state controller and then decided to run for state treasurer. The Republican Party at the time decided not to endorse her. And during all of this time, during her political comeback campaign, she's murdered. This is the 911 call. Something's wrong with my wife. She's not breathing. I don't know what happened to her. On July 8, 2006, Kathy's husband of three years finds her unconscious in their Reno home. He got up early that day, he said. He did some chores around the house, did some dishes, and then he went to the bedroom because Kathy didn't get up. 
He rolls her over, tries to wake her up, and she's unresponsive. She's not moving, which everyone thought was a great thing at first. Because remember, he's a registered nurse, and he finds her in trouble. So he calls an ambulance. She's unresponsive, and he's starting to give her CPR, saying that she shows signs of a massive heart attack. He's already jumping to that conclusion suggesting that the heart attack was brought on by politics and all of the worry. Friends and family are by her side at the hospital, including her 26-year-old daughter, Dallas Augustine. Dallas and Chaz tell everyone at the time they're not giving up hope. She's strong. She'll come out of it. But she's in a coma, and doctors say there is no chance of recovery. The family make a tough decision along the lines of Kathy's wishes, and the machines are turned off. Kathy is dead. The first reports listed Kathy's death, the cause of death, as a massive heart attack. Chaz is now a widower. On July 12th, police launch an investigation. They deem her death suspicious. And after talking to her brother, who had just seen her a few days prior, he said she was just 50 years old. She was happy, she was healthy, and had no heart problems. Two detectives are assigned to watch over her autopsy, and the medical examiner determines that there's no evidence to support a heart attack. So now, they're going to look at the toxicology. And that's going to be done by the FBI laboratory. It's sent there because it's only going to take two weeks to get the results as opposed to Washoe County, which is already backlogged, and that was going to take between six and eight weeks at the time. So Reno police are just telling the media, well, just wait, we'll give you the results as soon as we get them. So now the local news stations start looking into Chaz Higgs' past, and Kathy's family and friends start painting a picture, saying that Chaz and Kathy were having a lot of problems. One local newspaper reported that Kathy kicked Chaz out of her house for a short time, and her daughter also said that her mom and stepfather were having a lot of problems and were fighting a lot. He was also talking about leaving her, and Kathy said that Chaz had drained one of their joint bank accounts and that he was having an affair. At one time, police were called to their house in Las Vegas because one of their fights was so loud. On July 13th, Chaz does a TV interview. Just two days after Kathy's death, he says that he loved Kathy, and it's crazy for anyone to assume that he had anything to do with her death. On Friday, Dallas goes to Kathy's house, and she finds Chaz on the ground, covered in blood, and his wrists are cut. Hi friends, we are Carl and Joanne, and our podcast is Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. In our lighthearted podcasts, we share our unique ability to find humor in our marriage, adventures, and everyday life. Everything from crashing cars, practical jokes, unique blend of sarcasm, Joanne's ADHD, Carl's ability to be annoyed and entertained at the same time. If you need a little laughter and want to have some fun, find us on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you upload your podcasts. We are also on YouTube. Just search Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. Goldilocks and the Silver Fox. This is Fire Dispatch. Okay, what are we going out there for? Kathleen Augustine's husband's attempted suicide. Okay, do you know what mess is? Slit his wrist. He's unconscious. Next to Chaz is a suicide note blaming Kathy's political enemies for her death saying that he wanted to be buried next to her, that he loves her, and he wanted to be on the other side, in the sunshine, holding her hand. Chaz was taken to a nearby hospital for treatment, and then later for evaluation. And now, the Las Vegas Police Department are involved. The next day, he didn't show for his wife's memorial service. At the memorial, Kathy's stepson, Greg, says that he wants answers. He thinks that this was foul play. And if that's the case, he wants his father's body exhumed also. Meanwhile, Kathy's daughter, Dallas, is telling the media Chaz would have nothing to gain. She inherited the small fortune, not him. A few weeks later, the bombshell. 
The toxicology report from the FBI is back, and we find out that Kathy Augustine died after being injected with a powerful muscle relaxant called succinylcholine, used to immobilize patients when breathing tubes are inserted. And around this time, the medical examiner also discovers something that wasn't in the report earlier. They see a small puncture wound on her hip from a needle. Higgs was arrested in Virginia. In 2007, the murder trial would begin, with wall-to-wall coverage from every single station, including Las Vegas and Reno. At one point, I remember, a co-worker took the stand and said that Chaz hated his wife. He was having an affair, couldn't wait to get rid of her, and he called her a lot of names, including controlling. Another witness took the stand and said that Chaz was once talking to her about a prominent murder case in Reno and said, all you have to do to get away with murder is give someone a little sucks because you can't trace it after they die. Again, this is the drug that was found in Kathy's system and a drug that a nurse like him would have access to. Prosecutors reminded the jury that after Kathy's death, He tried to commit suicide, acted suspicious, acted guilty, and then he wouldn't go to her funeral. They then played the 911 call in full, where Chaz doesn't seem to be worried about Kathy. And they talked about his ride in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. They said that he just sat there and read a newspaper. The defense starts pleading their case, and they start putting character witnesses up on the stand who say that he was a great nurse, that he had no complaints, that he loved saving lives, and that he took an oath. They say that he tried to commit suicide because he was so sad and heartbroken over losing Kathy, and that he couldn't go to her funeral, and he was upset about that too, because he was being watched in the hospital after a failed suicide attempt. And they point out the fact that he was a nurse, and they're using this to their defense. They say that he would have known how to administer that drug to make it the most effective into an artery, not her buttocks, where that puncture wound is. And they say that he was in the process of leaving her, that he had no real motive at the time. His attorneys say that her political opponents, they're the ones with the real motive. She was a hated woman in politics, and she was up for re-election. Or... Her estranged daughter had a motive. She stood to inherit more than a million dollars and a Las Vegas mansion and a Reno home. The case is handed off to a jury on Friday at the end of June in 2007. They come back nine hours later. Chaz Higgs looks at the jury as they read the verdict. Higgs was found guilty of first-degree murder. He poisoned his wife, Kathy Augustine. He dropped his head but showed little emotion in court. Chaz would be sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 20 years. After the verdict, Charles Augustine's children, who were suspicious of their own father's death, call for an investigation. After all, Chaz was the nurse for their dad. And Kathy had told his son Greg just days before he died that his father was improving moving him to a rehab ward for long-term care. Then suddenly he suffers this massive organ failure out of nowhere and dies from complications from stroke according to the death certificate. No autopsy is conducted at the time, and he's buried. Charles' son told reporters Kathy and Chaz had a motive. She would inherit the Las Vegas mansion and a million dollars. So his body is pulled out of the ground. But tests determine that there is no trace of drug in Charles Augustine's body. In 2009, the murder conviction is upheld in Nevada Supreme Court. And shortly after, Dallas Augustine tells reporters she's very happy about it. Dallas says that she is ready to close this hurtful chapter in her life. The then 27-year-old married her 39-year-old wife, Jessie McCaskill, in Coronado, California. The next year, Dallas ran for state office, trying to fall in her mom's footsteps, and actually ran in the same open Assembly District 12 seat 
that her mom once held when she entered politics in the 90s. She lost and moved with her wife to Arizona. She had a new job and she was working for the State Department of Corrections. On August 27, 2012, Dallas and her wife Jessie are found dead in their Phoenix home after someone asked police to check on the couple. Police find their bodies near the front door. There was a broken plate near them, but no other signs of a struggle, and there was a gun on the floor near their bodies. Police said that they died in an apparent murder-suicide. They say Kathy Augustine's daughter Dallas was the killer, first shooting her wife as she tried to leave the house, then turning the gun on herself. Friends say their relationship had been strained. One woman had packed her bags ready to leave. Police said that Dallas had been having an affair months prior to the murder. But the relationship had turned sour. The mistress threatening to tell Augustine's wife about the affair unless she got paid some hush money. Jesse found out anyway and kicked Dallas out of the house. Afterwards, Dallas begged to come back and get back together and she threatened suicide. Friends said that Dallas was living at a hotel and wrote a confession about the affair and an apology on Facebook. So the couple, they agreed to work things out and planned to move away together to Florence, Arizona, closer to Dallas's new job. She had just completed basic training, training for the Department of Corrections. Dallas was 32. Her wife, Jessie, was 50. After she killed her wife and herself, an author who wrote a book about Kathy Augustine's story shared a little insight. He said that she never wanted to be interviewed for the book about her mom. He said, Dallas and Kathy were never really that close. They didn't have much of a mother-daughter relationship. He said that Dallas had struggled with drugs and there might have been some mental health issues there. I reached out to Kathy's brother, Philip Alfano, and Chaz Higgs' twin brother, Mike Higgs, before doing this podcast. I haven't heard back from them, but if I do, I will update the episode. I'll keep you posted. Now, speaking of his brother, Mike, if you watch the very old Dateline episodes about this case, you actually believe that Chaz was acquitted or that he was never behind bars because his twin brother is doing all the cutaway walking shots. So it makes it look like he's not in prison. But he is. I just checked. Chaz Higgs is 53 years old behind bars in Nevada State Prison. Kathy would be 63 today. And no doubt she would be serving in state politics. I have her picture and case photos on my website, truecrimedeadline.com. And of course, we're on Twitter and Instagram as well. Investigators, until next time. Thank you for investigating True Crime Deadline with Matt Johnson. For more information about the podcast, visit truecrimedeadline.com. And remember, all tips regarding a case should go to the police. Until next time. Mr. Gatsby, want a cookie? Good boy. Now, a post-episode shout-out to the investigators who wrote reviews on Apple Podcasts. Thank you. Uh, Thank you to Adri Russ, who says that she likes watching me as a local news reporter in L.A. Thanks for that. Alex Stone, who listens Over the Pond in the U.K. And Just Jenny 2012, talking about the Case Break mini-episode that I hosted with my little sister, Jenny. And she said that she enjoyed that. So thanks again. Um, I really appreciate it. And it really helps independent podcasts like this one get noticed. It's easy. It's free. Hit five star, subscribe, tell a friend, write a review. And please use your real name and your podcast name. If you are a podcast host, I want to give you a proper shout out. Now, I'm also excited to tell you about a couple true crime podcasts that I just found. One is called Moms and Murder. And the other one is called Naptime Nancy Drew. You can find them and us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, anywhere where you binge, where they're waiting for you. Just click the button. We're there. Okay. So the first one I'm going to tell you about is the one about moms and murder, hosted by two friends who talk about real life stuff, being moms, raising kids, and of course, murder. 
Hey guys, it's Melissa and Mandy with the Moms and Murder podcast. We're a true crime podcast that's sure to make you laugh without compromising the seriousness of the content. Mm. Despite our name, we aren't just for the moms. Our show is for all the Diet Coke drinking, chicken loving, Dateline watching people in your life. Come for the murder and stay for the witty humor and pop culture references. And you never know, you may even hear from some of your favorite names in the world of true crime, like Dateline's Josh Mankiewicz. Do you have a preference on what we call you, Josh Mankiewicz, Manx, Sir Manx a lot? Uh, I don't hear Sir, Sir Manx a lot quite as often as I... <laughs> I can make it happen for you. <laughs> Broken Homicide's Derek Lavasser. Are you tearing up on me? I saw you like... <laughs> So beautiful, everything you're saying. <laughs> or even America's sweetheart, Ali Sweeney. The neighbor suggested that perhaps Kathleen had been attacked by... An owl. The owl theory um, that Melissa and Allie Sweeney Stop believe. Like Again, that. so judgy. <laughs> Check out Moms and Murder anywhere podcasts are found. Now, this other podcast I want to tell you about is a newer cast, and it's pretty great. Lots of news clips, a lot of new information for the cases that I haven't heard before. And if you like my style, you're going to like Naptime Nancy Drew, hosted by a mom who chooses some really cool cases. Check it out. Do you have an obsession with true crime? Are you intrigued by the mystery and the rabbit holes surrounding unsolved cases? And can you appreciate the snark and humor of an exhausted mother of two young children? Then you should click subscribe to Naptime Nancy Podcast. Throw on some baby shark for your kids or pet or partner. Slide your headphones on and join me as I talk some true crime during nap time. Available on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Audioboom, and other listening apps.